What's going on, everybody? Happy Memorial Day. Thanks for stopping in. This is Ron Sneller coming at you, and I just wanted to take 10 or 15 minutes and make a quick video to clarify some concepts that I presented a few weeks ago on my friend Brandon's podcast. So on his podcast, we were talking about some financial mistakes that people make, especially in, in terms of retirement planning. And I gave an example of a retirement program or a strategy that I showed recently to a young man. And it involved using, of all things, a cash value whole life insurance contract. And it really resonated and struck a chord with a lot of his audience who was, was interested and was asking questions uh, because I, I talked about the sample program and I used some numbers, um, but I just thought it would be helpful if I, if I clarified and, and brought up some of those numbers here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna share my screen and, and, and show you the concept. Of, and this is a real case study. And of course, I'm not going to use the client's name or divulge his identity just for privacy purposes, but, but just know that this is a real case study. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare using cash value life insurance in your retirement strategy versus using the traditional or conventional wisdom of a pre-tax 401k. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're, we have a, a screen here, a PowerPoint slideshow type thing. And, and what we've got is, is really just a, a general T-chart to compare some things, right? So this is the capital equivalent value of of life insurance, cash flow life insurance versus a 401k or an IRA. <clears throat> so the actual plan that I presented to this, this young man, uh, during the uh, accumulation phase, he's 25 years old. So during the accumulation phase, he's going to contribute 10% of his income into uh, a life insurance policy. So that represents because he makes $87,000 a year, that represents an annual contribution of $8,700 for his premium. And so when we run that out and illustrate it over the course of 40 years and, and using dividends, and of course, life insurance dividends, they're, they're not guaranteed, right? But with life insurance, the companies are very conservative. They will not give you some pie in the sky projection and say, hey, this is what we hope we can earn. No, they actually take what the dividend rate is today and they run it out for 30 years or 40 years or however long you're, you're going to be in the plan. Um, so they show you a very realistic view of, of what you're going to earn. So over the course of 40 years, contributing $8,700 a year, this gentleman would have just a hair under $800,000 at age 65. Now that's, that's a nice savings clip. It's consistent disciplined savings, but it's not a great rate of return. It's somewhere between three and a half to 4%. But if you're open-minded, I'll teach you very quickly why wealth is not about chasing rates of return, right? And I'll show you why we use life insurance. Now, most people don't think of life insurance as, as any kind of savings tool or something that you should use in your retirement strategy. And when you look at the rates of return on that, I mean, that rate of return is meh, but we use life insurance because of how the distributions work, how it spoons off cash flow in retirement. And number two, especially because of how the tax code treats it. The tax code is the big thing. So, Again, during his working years, he's contributing 10% of his income per year. And then at age 65, he's projected to have just under $800,000. Now, when we get to retirement and we start the distribution phase, this is where this strategy or this product is, is really going to shine. So in retirement, this gentleman will receive a 6.4% distribution rate from his insurance contract. And so what we did is he wanted to run that out, cash flow until age 90, so a 25-year period. We programmed it for the maximum amount of cash flow. And so that would give him just a hair under $51,000 per year. But here's the thing, the way the tax code treats life insurance, there's no federal income tax due, no state income tax due, no local tax due. Like if he lives in a, a city where there's a, a, a local tax. 
So his net is actually the same amount because he doesn't pay one cent of income tax. And so again, we ran it out to age 25 and, and there's a death benefit attached to this, of course, because it is life insurance. And, and during his working years, his, his death benefits way higher. Like it's, it's over well over a million dollars at its peak. But when he gets, but when he begins to draw against the policy in retirement, now that, that death benefit's gonna come down. But if he were to die at age 90, he would still have $435,000 to leave to his family and they wouldn't pay a cent of income tax. So let's look at how this works, right? So the gentleman will give the insurance company a total of $350,000. And then in retirement, he's going to receive $1.3 million of cash flow and not pay a cent of income tax. And then his family's going to receive over $400,000 of death benefit and they won't pay a cent of income tax. And now you're beginning to see why so many wealthy people utilize this product in their plans. Now you're beginning to see why so many of these large corporations fund their CEOs and their executives, why they fund their, their bonus plans with cash value life insurance. You're beginning to see why the big banks are the largest purchasers of cash value life insurance. Did you know that the largest banks in the world have billions of cash value on their balance sheet as a tier one asset? And did you know that 22% of all cash value assets in this country, they're owned by the top wealthiest 1%. Now, what do these big banks and these corporations and the wealthy know that the average Joe doesn't? Makes you think, doesn't it? Now, look, let's compare that to a 401k and how that works, right? So we're going to go to the right-hand side of your screen now. So in your traditional 401k or, or IRA, now what we're going to do, like my big gripe or complaint about using a 401k is that so many people just put money into a 401k or put money into an IRA without really thinking about it, without understanding the ramifications of what they're doing, right? They've got no end game in mind, like no exit strategy, no spend down plan. They just do it because they think they're supposed to. And they don't think about like, how is the distribution going to work? How, how are taxes going to work? So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the end in mind. We're going to start with how much money do we want to receive like net cash flow after taxes, right? And so again, we're just going to compare it to what we just did on the left side with the cash flow insurance contract. Okay. So what we're after, what we desire is $50,000 of after tax spendable income. But remember, we got to pay tax on that income. And so we're just going to assume a total tax rate of 20%. So we'll say 15% federal taxes and 5% state taxes. And I, look, I know what you're thinking, but Ron, we're $25 trillion in debt. We got to fix social security. We got to fix Medicare. There's all these stimulus packages and we're going to have to print all that money. And somebody is going to have to pay for that. Taxes have to go way up. Look, I'm with you and I agree, but I just want to be conservative and talk about like what tax rates are today. Okay, so we're just gonna use 20% for, for this example. So again, if we wanted $50,000 of income, but we had to pay 20% taxes, we'd actually have to withdraw 62,500 from the 401k every year. And again, we're reverse engineering, we're working backwards. So we want 50,000, we actually have to withdraw 62,500 every year. But how much money do we need to build up in an account to make that happen? Again, reverse engineering, we need to know what is the safe withdrawal rate? What do all the financial institutions and, and the researchers say? Like, how much can we take out of our account every year safely without risking running out of money, right? And that rate is 3%. And now I know what you're probably thinking. Now, now wait a second, how, how is it 3%? Because doesn't the stock market return six, eight, ten percent 10% every year? It usually does, but here's the thing you have to remember. We're talking about you as a retiree. So you're no longer saving and investing. Instead, you're withdrawing money out of the account. And during the down years, when your money, when your assets have declined 30, 
40, 50%, and you're withdrawing money out of a depleted asset, which is the worst thing that you can do, by the way. But as your money's declining in value and you're withdrawing money out of the asset, that's like a double whammy or a double negative because you have market, force, market forces pushing the value of your money down and you're withdrawing. So what happens is you deplete that account so quickly that when things turn around and things start to recover, you don't have enough money left in the account to fully take advantage of the good volatility. You don't have enough money left in the account to fully take advantage of the compounding interest when, when things start to recover, right? And so you can't, I mean, we can't really say to retirees like, look, so we're going to have you live on $50,000 per year when things are good, but just, just know that if we have a recession, you're going to have to cut back, like way back. Like you're going to have to go from living on 50,000 a year, like down to 10 or 20, right? That's not going to work with your, with your uh, average retiree, right? So that 3% rule, it's a way to pace yourself throughout all the ups, throughout all the downs. It's a way to pace yourself and keep your income level so you don't have to cut back on spending. And so you won't run out of money if you, know, if you live a long time, if you do live to age 90 or 95, okay? Now, the other thing is that we may have some people watching this video that they know a little bit more about financial research and studies and they might be saying, hey, wait a second. I've always heard it was the 4% withdrawal rule. William Bengen in the 1990s and the Trinity study and the Monte Carlo simulations. And you'd be right, except all of that research was done prior to the year 2000, prior to the, the dot-com crash, prior to 9-11. It, it was done prior to the financial crisis in 2008. And it was done prior to where the Federal Reserve thought to themselves, hmm, maybe we'll just keep interest rates at zero for over a decade right? So that old research doesn't work in our, our new reality, right? So in 2013, and I'll, I'll put the link on your screen, in 2013, two professors from the American College of Financial Services, uh, they partnered with the retirement researcher at Morningstar named David Blanchett, and they took a fresh look at, at the stock market history and at the bond rates, and they had to lower the safe withdrawal rate to 2.8%. To keep our math easy, we're just gonna round up and call it the 3% rule. And I, I put the link on your screen there. So if you're interested in checking it out, you can always come back, rewatch the video, and, and just put that link into your browser. Or you can just Google it as well. You could probably find it pretty easily. <clears throat> but just know that, look, I mean, you could take out more than 3%, but, but if you do, there's a high likelihood that you're gonna run out of money. So we wanna keep you safe we're gonna use a 3% rule. So again, our goal, $50,000 after taxes. With a 20% tax rate, we have to take out 62.5. And again, working backwards with a 3% safe withdrawal rate, how much money would we need? 2.1 million. Now let me ask you something. How many multimillionaires do you know walking around? <laughs> because I don't know many right? You would need $2.1 million to live on $50,000 of, of after-tax spendable income, right? Now, what is it going to take to get there, right? Now, now we want to remember, this is a real-life case study. And so we're simply going to compare uh, the gentleman who implemented the plan on the left, like those same numbers for the strategy on the right. So again, the assumed savings plan, it's 10% of his annual income, so that's $8,700 a year over the course of 40 years. What rate of return would he need to build up to $2.1 million? And he would need a 7.5 net rate of return. And I say net because look, investment advisors don't work for free. The, the people who manage a 401k, they don't work for free. There, there's fees and expenses, right? So we're just going to assume a 1% fee. And, and that's probably pretty conservative. It's, it's on the lower end. Um, but just know that that 1% fee, it does come out of the account. So the investment performance has to make up for that. So what you actually would have to receive is an 8.5 gross return. And I, and I mean, real return, compounded annual growth rate, not average returns, which is a, a number that uh, investment advisors like to use because it looks better. Now, I could do a whole nother video on that. I'm not going to get into it too deeply here, 
but just know there's something more to that. Now, look, you might be thinking 8.5% rate of return. That doesn't sound crazy out of line. And you're right. It's not. Now, look, it's a lot more than the stock market or than the S&P has done since the turn of the century, like since 2000. Uh, it's, it's been way lower than 8.5% of return since then. But in the grand scheme of things throughout history, 8.5%, it's not crazy. And look, remember, this isn't a crazy savings rate either. It's, it's about $700 per month. So depending on how you're paid, bi-weekly or, or twice a month, look, you're just saving between $300 and $350 per, per pay period, right? It's a nice savings habit to get into that's good discipline, but that's not a ridiculous number to save. So why don't we have more multimillionaires walking around? Well, because life happens. During the down markets, people panic. They sell at the wrong times. They buy at the wrong times. That's just human nature. And the other thing, in a 401k, that money's locked up, so they can't touch it, right? So if things get tight, they just stop contributing, and that destroys their savings rate, and it destroys their long-term performance. Or if things get really tight, they might actually raid their 401 account early. So not only do they have to pay all of those taxes right now, which hurts their performance, but then they have to pay a 10% penalty to the IRS. Do you know that your money's not locked up in the life insurance plan that's shown on the left side? Do you know that you can access that money for emergencies or to take advantage of opportunities? It's pretty incredible. But listen, this is all called, all these mistakes, it's called behavioral finance. It's human nature. We make mistakes. But that's why a recent Dalbar study suggested that the average investor, because of the mistakes that they make, they actually achieve about a 3% real rate of return over their working years, right? But listen, so, so that's what I'm, I mean, that's what I'm saying here is that a lot of things have to go right for your 401k IRA plan and all the investments and all the performance and everything just to equal what we're doing with the cash flow life insurance. But there's additional benefits as well. Now, remember, we talked about in retirement, we're receiving that cash flow and we don't pay any federal tax. We don't pay any state tax. We don't pay any local tax. We, it doesn't count with Medicare premium offset and there's no tax on your social security either. And here's the thing, by doing the plan on the right and taking that much income, it makes 85% of your social security taxable. So you participated in the social security program your entire working life. The government's mismanaged it. They've stolen from it. They gave you a paltry return. You probably could have saved and grown that money better than they did. And then they give you a mere pittance in retirement. And then to pour salt in the wound, if you claim too much income, then you have to give tens of thousands, if not into the hundreds of thousands, of that social security benefit back to the government. And as a final kick in the groin, this isn't optional, this is mandatory. The government makes you do this, right? But on the left-hand side, using cash flow insurance, your social security benefits are completely income tax-free. So let's wrap this up. When you use cash value assets of a life insurance policy, you can build as much wealth as you want completely off the radar screen of the Internal Revenue Service for income tax purposes. You can have access to your capital during your working years as you grow it without the 10% penalty like you had in a 401k. You can create predictable retirement cash flow and not pay a cent of income tax on it. And you can leave a legacy to your family and they won't pay a cent of income tax on it. So here's the thing. I can take $800,000 of cash value life insurance Take $800,000, carve the taxes out of it, and let you spend it as if it's $2 million. And guess what else? I don't have any market risk. I don't have any index that I have to follow. I don't have any complicated investment schemes where I'm paying some investment advisor all these fees, hoping that he's going to do a good job, hoping he's not going to screw me over, hoping that he's not going to lose all my money. And you know what else? I don't care who's in the Oval Office. So when it comes down to it, do you want a strategy that's predictable or just probable? Because on the right-hand side, that 401k plan, the stock market will probably perform. Probably, maybe. Or do you want something that's predictable where you'll sleep well at night? Why take the risk? And I want to leave you with this one last thought. Do you realize that when you have a 401k 
and you're only able to spend $50,000 per year, your investment advisor is actually making a fee off the entire $2.1 million balance. So in closing, let me ask you this. Whose retirement plan truly is this? Yours or theirs? Please leave your thoughts in the comments. And if you are interested in learning more about this concept and how to implement it into your financial life, please message me here on Facebook or send me an email at ronaldsneller08 at gmail.com. Thanks for stopping in and have an awesome Memorial Day. God bless.